Welcome to episode 207. Today on Book Chat, I am interviewing Andre Ruffig, narrator of audiobook Dangerous to Know, Jane Austen's Rakes and Gentlemen Rogues. Stay tuned. Everyone, I am your host, Tamara Ford, and welcome to Book Chat here on the Shelf Addiction Podcast. If you're new here, welcome. If you're returning, as always, welcome back. Here on Book Chat, we get bookish with roundtable book discussions, book recommendation lists, interviews, and more. If you'd like to check out book reviews and other bookish posts, please visit shelfaddiction.com. Now, a bit about today's guest. Andre Refik is an actor, singer, and voiceover artist. His work has taken him across the UK and Europe and has included a wide variety of different genres, from Shakespeare to new writing, opera to modern musicals, and voiceover work to screen work. He's also going to be sharing with us an anthology that he recently narrated called Dangerous to Know, Jane Austen's Rakes and Gentlemen Rogues. All of Andre's social media links are below in the show notes, so if you'd like to connect, you know where to find him. If you'd like to comment on something you've heard during today's episode, you can find me on Twitter at Shelf Addiction, or you can call in and leave an internet voice message via SpeakPipe. The links for everything you'll need are below in the show notes. Thank you for joining me today, Andre. How are you doing? I'm very well. Thank you for inviting me. Oh, absolutely. I'm very excited to talk to you today because I love audiobooks, if you don't know. (laughs) (laughs) And my audience loves audiobooks. So it's always a pleasure to talk to a narrator or a voice actor. And you're that. So welcome. (laughs) Thank you. (laughs) Absolutely. So let me start with this. Do you hmm. prefer to be called a voice actor or an audiobook narrator? Um, I, I think I'm happy with either, to be honest. I mean, I've, in terms of what I've done, is probably more voice acting. Mm-hmm. Um, but if someone wants to call me an audiobook narrator, that's fine too. So okay, yeah. awesome. I just don't want to offend because you know some no. people are really funny about that. <laughs> so you know. <laughs> Awesome. So, okay, let's get a little bit into how you began narrating audiobooks, because from what I understand, you have stage credits that include yes. musicals and children's theater and yeah. operettas. How did yeah. you get into audiobooks? Um, well, I think after, so I've been working as an actor now for about 10 years or so. Um, about five years ago, I decided to, to try my hand at voice acting and voiceover work in general. Um, and and then I suppose it was maybe two years ago I looked into uh, working in audiobooks. Um, I just I'd, I'd always been into audiobooks in terms of I'd always listened to them since I was uh, a little child, really. Mm-hmm. Um, and I just thought, well, it's something I've always loved, so I might as well try and see if I can do it myself. Um, and uh, so there we are. And then I, I, I did a, a few volunteer audiobooks for, for a company called Listening Books. And uh, those went down quite well. So I decided to go, um, go more fully in it, into it and uh, joined ACX. And yeah, here I am. Awesome. So do you think that your theater training has affected your approach to audiobook narration? I, I would say definitely. I think um, in theater, obviously, a lot of it, well, most of it is text based um and it always starts with a with a text and um, and especially when it comes to auditions so much of that is about having to read text off the bat um having to sight read and um having to deliver performance um and i think that helps a lot with with uh, reading an audiobook yeah what's your favorite thing about narrating an audiobook um, well, many different things. One, one is the fact that uh, as opposed to theatre work, I don't have to learn any lines. That's great. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think the other thing is being able to play so many different characters, being able to read so many different characters as opposed to in theatre where you usually only play one person. Um, you're creating the whole world yourself and that sort of control and, and at the same time freedom that comes with that is, uh, it's really exciting, I think. Yeah. Well, speaking about creating the world, mm-hmm. you know, I say narration really can really add a lot to a story or really take it away. Mm-hmm. Um, how do you go about, you know, developing what you think, you know, your vision of how these characters sound, 
when you record, you know, for the book? Well, obviously, the first thing I do is is just read the story for myself, um, so that I get the the big picture, I get the whole story in in my head, um, and I sort of look at the ways in which the characters are described by by the author, but also the ways they behave, the way other um, characters in the story react to them Mm -hmm. um and it sort of builds a picture of of the way the character sounds and i I mean i do have a list of different vocal styles that i can uh use um but sometimes the the voice just comes in the doing it doing of it and sort of in the practicing of it um without even thinking in in too much detail if i've if i've worked on the the story if i've worked on the character a lot um the uh the voice just just appears in a way just from all the work i've done it appears almost subconsciously um because it's it's then ingrained in my mind and suddenly uh, you know i'll i'll give a character um a certain voice quality like i'll i'll give him um, a lisp or a, or um maybe a high pitched tone or or something mm-hmm. and that won't even be something i would have thought about consciously and gone oh i think this character needs that it would have just happened because i would have thought of, thought about the characters in the story and it just appears naturally in a, in a way. Yes, absolutely. So I have wondered about this. You know, I listen to a lot of audiobooks. Yeah. So when I listen to long audiobooks, yeah. I always wonder, I know they are not sitting there for eight hours a day reading. <laughs> so how do you come back to the exact same voice every time for each character? <laughs> um, well, there's certain things... Uh, we certain aud- audiobook narrators do. I mean, what one example is um, sometimes just to use a coloured marker pen um, if you're using a hard copy, or if you're on a um, on a tablet or something, just to highlight in a particular colour uh, the same character, um, so that each time you see it, you know immediately. Oh, it, it that the association of of that colour immediately brings you back to the character. Um, it's it's sometimes and then the other thing is often you do make mistakes but it's fine because you can always correct those in the edit um yeah (laughs) i mean i'll I'll sometimes read a character and then realize that by the end of the sentence oh no it wasn't that one and i'll just stop it and read the sentence again thankfully it's it's none of it is live so um mistakes are are fine as long as you don't make too many of them it's it's okay So let's say you get in a situation where you have to keep stopping for mistakes. Is it hard to like pull yourself back into the story? Yeah. I mean, I generally don't make that many mistakes. You know, it'll be the odd one here and there. So that's not too bad. Um, I think if I was making a lot, then it probably would be hard to get to carry on in the within the narrative because you do want to keep some continuity going um mm-hmm. otherwise it would feel very stunted and would be difficult as you say to to stay within a st- the story but the odd mistake here and there is fine the, w- the way i i see it is a bit like if you're reading someone's writing um like a draft copy of, of some writing and there's the odd spelling mistake here and there mm-hmm. i don't think it really matters but if there's constant mistakes the whole way through, then it's hard to concentrate on, on what's happening. And it's, for me, it's the same thing. If I'm constantly making mistakes, then yes, it would be, it would be very difficult to stay within it. But the odd one here and there, it's, it really doesn't, I don't think it bothers me that much. Yeah, that's cool. Because that's true. I mean, as a listener, mm. anything that is not consistent, like, constantly mm. <laughs> it mm. really pulls us yeah. out of the listening experience yeah so yeah that's awesome that you think about that and mm. i think all narrators do generally speaking i think <laughs> yeah yeah um so tell me what do you do as far as accents because clearly you have a natural british accent do yes. you do other accents um i do i mean i i do do an american one i'd, I'd rather not try it to, for, the, for your listeners <laughs> just in case but um no my, so obviously this is my natural accent i do a lot of uh different british accents you know working class upper class and everything in between different regional accents and um foreign accents as well my my native tongue is is french so i i obviously do a french accent as well in the uh clip uh, that you may be playing there's there's certainly a prominent french character in there as well um <laughs> yes so so yeah i think it's um yeah that's it basically <laughs> 
So do you tend to kind of just stay toward, you know, books that take place in, you know, I don't know, England or, you know, yeah, Britain or I'm, France yeah. or someplace else where you can kind of slide into it easily? Yeah, I think those would probably be the ones I, I would tend to do more. Um, I think, again, so in one of these stories that I've one of these short stories in this anthology, um, there's an American character, but then it's just mm -hmm. a small role within a, a big, a larger story where the vast majority of the characters are, are British. Um, so I probably would focus more on, on that. And then if I, within that, if I need to do the odd, you know, American th character here and there, then that's fine. But I probably wouldn't focus on, on reading a story where the main protagonist and where most of the characters are American, just because I know there are so many other people out there who would do it better. Um, exactly. Yeah. Focusing probably on f British and then also French characters would, would be my um, main focus. Yeah. So I'm curious though, when you do your American accent, yes. what region do you think it sounds like? <laughs> it's from? Well, uh, um, this, this particular one that I did um, because it's based in 1800 um, it's um it's a sort of almost mid-Atlantic, if that means anything at all, um, because it's a sort of old-fashioned American accent, which is, which you you'll hear in you would hear in you know old films in the thirties and forties, and um, oh. which is almost sort of a little bit British. It's sort of in between. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. So that yeah. in that particular case, it would be. Otherwise, if I was to do a general American accent, I'm, I'm not sure where it would be from. I, th I think it would just be, um, I, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I don't think it would hmm, be a specific okay. from a specific region, but just, just a, a general standard. Cool. So, okay. You told me earlier that you listen to audiobooks for a long time. Yes. So, do you have any favorite narrators that you like to listen to? Um, well, yeah, there are a few actually. I mean, I've, I've listened to the whole of, uh, Harry Potter by Stephen Fry. Um, I found mm -hmm. that great. Um, there's a, there's a narrator called Hugh Fraser, um, a British actor who's narrated a lot of Agatha Christie, um, sort of a lot of Hercule Poirot and, and that sort of thing. And I've really enjoyed him as well yeah and uh i do quite i have quite liked the late roy dotris who narrated the first five books in uh george r, r. martin's song of ice and fire as well but he, i think he did a, a good job on that nice i've been meaning to read those or listen to those rather i hear mm. they're quite amazing on audiobooks so yeah yeah yes awesome it's quite epic <laughs> yeah i know i love that show i need to read the books <laughs> um so obviously you enjoy books as well so you have probably mm. a few favorite authors are there any authors mm. like on your quote-unquote wish list that you love to read something for them well yes but i think they're they're taken already unfortunately i mean i'd I, as i said i love george r. r martin for example i love um terry pratchett as well um i love agatha christie um but yeah most of those have already been recorded um in terms of in terms of new books that haven't i i don't really know i mean i'm always on the lookout but uh but yeah not sure mm -hmm. well the book we're talking about today is historical fiction and yes. So I'd love to know, what is your favorite genre to narrate? Do you like historical fiction best? I mean, you mentioned a few older things. So, yeah. or do you like I, others as well? Um, I do like historical fiction a lot. Um, I think uh, the styles I tend to read would be historical fiction, uh, fantasy, and then maybe crime and whodunits, those, those sort of styles. What I like about historical fiction is it is you feel immersed in a in a certain world which is real but at the same time removed from the one you actually live in whereas you know mm -hmm. in fantasy it's a completely different world or in in crime fiction it's the same world in which we live in 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 historical fiction it's it is the same world and it's true and it's and all the sort of the places are real all the um all the, the things that people do are real, but obviously all the ca the individual characters are, uh, are fictional. And I'm, I think I like the combination of those two things, of the, of the fact and the fiction, in a way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Okay, so tell me, are you working on anything cool right now? 
Yes. So the book I'm working on right now is called Dangerous to Know, Jane Austen's Rakes and Gentlemen Rogues. And it's a series of short stories um, based on Jane Austen and featuring the sort of, shall we say, the cads, the rakes uh, characters. So the the the, um, the bad boys in a way. And it's um, uh-huh. either their backstories or prequels or simply parallel stories featuring them as the central character obviously in jane austen novels they're always sort of outsider characters whereas in these they're the central character and it's um sees you know sometimes it explains how they got to be the way they are um sometimes it just explores uh, another side of their personality um and yeah and it's it's a great great set of stories I love anthologies you get a little bit of mm. everything and you get to try out mm. different authors yeah, absolutely. Um, and there's a, there's a very big range. And, um, yeah, and it's, it, it is really interesting because obviously as an audiobook narrator, each time you, you, uh, start on a new short story, obviously it's written in a slightly different style because each author has their own stamp on it. And it's really exciting to, to explore these different styles and it keeps it really interesting. Um, if obviously if you if you love an author then it's great reading a whole novel uh-huh. um but at the same time it's it's um really exciting to uh, to explore um writing by so many different authors and and uh, and trying to get a grip on on the different style of writing and the different mood and the different um attitudes and yeah it's it's great so instead of you know with one book you might have to deal with you know, obviously one author, maybe two, if it's two people mm. writing it. But do you mm. get notes from 11 different authors on this type of job? <laughs> <laughs> well, so far, I haven't had that much, which is hopefully a good sign. Um, I deal primarily with uh, Christina Boyd, who's uh, the editor. Um, and she's been absolutely lovely. Um, she's always given me her, her own notes. And then she's always um, been the contact point uh, between um, myself and the author of the particular story that I've uh, just recorded. And sometimes I do get notes and, uh, but it's, it's, they've been fairly minimal so far. The, so fingers crossed it's, it's all going well. Awesome. Congratulations on that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thanks. That's good. Okay. Well, let's take a really quick listen, um, to, dangerous to know and this is an excerpt yeah. from a wicked game and let the audience listen and let's talk about it after right my heart beat faster wondering what game she played but i continued across the entrance hall fitzwilliam paused by the front door and eyed me expectantly will you join me for a ride across the fields wickham i should be glad of your company i hesitated no i will not detain you i have a matter to take care of first He nodded amiably and left. Fitzwilliam had no sooner taken his leave than Lady Harlow emerged from the dining room and approached me. Without a word, she slipped into the library across the hall and gestured for me to follow. I stood rooted to the spot. This was madness, insanity, and it was decidedly improper. Thrusting aside my misgivings, I strode across the empty hallway and through the double doors, and regarded her in apprehension as she shut them behind us with great care. "'You take a dangerous risk,' I protested in a low voice as I turned to her. "'If anyone should see us!' She leaned back against the door. "'No one will see us, and what I have to say to you will take but a moment.' The blood rushed, pounding in my ears. I made no reply. "'I hope you will forgive me,' she whispered, and drew closer. The brandy last night made me tired. I fell asleep before I could come to you. When I said nothing, still nursing my peak, she leaned forward. Oh dear, you are angry with me, I think. The scent of violets teased me as she pressed her lips fleetingly on mine. I groaned and reached for her. No, she chided gently and pushed my hands away. Not here, not now, but soon, mon chéri, soon. Leave it to me. I bit back a sigh of frustration. I wanted her desperately. But for now, her promise would have to be enough. 
Okay, so let's talk about this short story. Hmm. Um, from what I can tell, it's a young George Wickham, yeah. and the, he is from Pride and Prejudice, yeah. if I remember correctly. Yeah. That's right. And he has a rendezvous with the French widow, and I did hear your French accent, <laughs> yes. which is very good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what did you think about this short story? Oh, well, it was it was really exciting. I mean, um, George Wickham is probably one of the more famous um of the characters in in the whole anthology actually um most people will know pride and prejudice um and what they know of george wickham is that he's a cad that he he sort of treats lydia bennett very badly um and he's not a character that um that many readers would sympathize with um initially they're taken by him and think he's quite charming and then they see him for what he is and no no one would really be on his side certainly not by the end of it um but this story obviously approaches it, approaches him as the hero in a way. And he initially appears to be um, quite a nice chap, quite a nice guy. <laughs> um, just obviously quite excitable, maybe a little bit naive, um, not uh, quite impetuous, not in control of of himself very much but then to start with he's probably in his early very early 20s um Mm -hmm. and then you sort of see uh his being seduced by this um more mature uh wily french widow who um who then completely disillusions him who he he ends up being he falls in love with her and then he ends up being completely disillusioned with love and becomes a bit like she is and and someone who will use other people uh, for their own benefit i see and it does make you um sort of feel for him which is which is not something i'd ever done before um and uh but at the same time it is quite within it is quite thrilling and and it's quite exciting following the the sort of love story or maybe lust story is is more appropriate way of describing it yeah, definitely that. I mean, the couple of minutes I listened to, I'm like, oh, sorry, George. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He thought he was going to do something. And yeah, no. Yeah, no. sorry. No. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so tell me, how did you do the widow's voice? Because that is something I always like to know mm. from male narrators. Yeah. Is how? Because you nailed this woman's voice and she sounded <laughs> really nice. And, uh, you know, sometimes the male narrators try to do that falsetto thing yeah. and you don't do it. Thank no. goodness, you don't do it. No, no, no. <laughs> Tell me how you develop the women's voice. Well, I think that ultimately I know that I'm never actually going to sound like a woman. Yeah. And I think for me, as, as a narrator, it's not about necessarily sounding exactly like the way that character would sound. It's about giving a flavor yes. of the character. And... Mm-hmm. If I just lighten my voice a bit, if I just raise it just a little, yeah, I think it's clear that it's, it's a, woman. a woman. Yes. Mm-hmm. And it doesn't have to be literal. It doesn't, because if I, yeah, as you say, if I was trying to do the whole falsetto thing, it would just sound comical. And I mean, that, that's can be used. <laughs> yeah. that, that's, there's a, a time and a place to use that as well. Exactly. But, yeah. um, if you want a character that, that is serious and that the audience are going to believe and they're not going to laugh at, then I think it's, it's unnecessary and you could just, just lighten it a bit and it will make the audience know that it is a woman and that's all you need to do really. Yes. I think. I agree with you. And I, again, I think you did a great job with it because oh, I've heard you. some bad ones. Let me tell you. But uh, <laughs> yeah, tell you. I can imagine. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Okay. So tell me, you, did you record this in your home studio then? I did, yes. I recorded it in the same place where I'm talking to you from right now. Cool. Tell me what your studio atmosphere is like when you're recording a book. Uh, quite warm. <laughs> um, it, so it's uh, very quiet. Um, it's quite a small space. Um, I sort of made it myself. So um, all I can see really is the microphone in front of me and my laptop or a tablet or a book, um, with, with my, uh, with sort of uh, my reflection filter in front of me. And then I have, um, uh, boards on either side and a blanket sort of, uh, over the top. Um, and so it's quite enclosed, but in a way that's good because it means I'm, 
fully immersed in the story there's there's no distractions it's uh yeah it's just me and me and the story that's awesome and i'm very glad to hear you have a blanket because when i tell people put a blanket over you if you are (laughs) they're like what i'm like yes please just get the blanket (laughs) i do understand (laughs) it works yeah yes absolutely absolutely so when you uh, record at home, do you also mm. do your own editing or do you have a director or a, a producer helping you? No, I do all the editing myself. Um, I, uh, yeah, I, I step out of the little studio and just do it in my, in, in my study, in my room, um, just on my laptop on, um, you know, Adobe Audition, which is a very good quality uh, um, editing sweet um and and yeah that's it really i mean i like the fact that i have control over it obviously it's more work for me and it takes more time Uh um but at the same time i have much more control over everything that comes out yes um and i feel that i sometimes i'm more critical of of myself than other people might be in the sense I, i will put more work into making it sound good which us the listeners appreciate because mm. that editing life is real. I have spent a yeah. long time <laughs> editing things, not a book, but oh, a podcast, yes. obviously. I can spend hours editing a 30 yeah. minute podcast if I really want to nitpick it to death, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I probably, if I, when I, because I do other voiceover work as well, if I'm, say, recording a, a one minute explainer video for example i would probably spend a lot more time relative to that one minute Mm -hmm. on the editing just to get it absolutely the sound absolutely perfect obviously because an audiobook in the end is is a a long long um is is a lot of material um i will spend a lot of time editing it but i won't spend as much so if i did a one minute minute explainer video i might spend a couple of hours editing it or maybe not a couple of hours but at least an hour editing it which is 60 times the amount of of uh, of finished material if i'm recording a one hour book a one hour short story i'm not going to spend 60 hours editing that um but i will spend a fair bit of time on it yeah, so I'm yeah. very curious since you do everything from start to finish. Yeah. So far and it's not as of the this recording date, the book is not done, but how no. many hours to date do you think you spent on Dangerous to Know? Uh, I haven't counted. I wish I had. Um I sort of I'm doing other jobs at the same time, uh-huh. so it's not clear to me because I'm not sort of doing, you know, 9 to 5 monday to friday i sort of do it sometimes during the day sometimes in the evening sometimes at the weekend um i i fit it around other things and i fit other things around that um and i'm working on several different projects so i i can't tell you honestly how how many hours i've done but it's probably quite a lot um oh i mean a rough estimate if if there's an hour's worth of if there's say one of the shortest of the short stories is about an, an hour, I probably spent three hours recording it um, to get it right. And then probably another four or five hours preparing it. And then maybe another six, seven hours editing it. So that's how much is that? 15, maybe less, Oof. something like that. Oh my yes. goodness. <laughs> It gives me a whole new appreciation for you. I'm going to tell you, like, oh, my gosh, that's insane. But the the end result is worth it, though. Well, hopefully, yeah. Yes, I think it will be. You know, I've heard some of it. So, you guys, you can count on me. It's it's good. (laughs) Good, good. (laughs) So, thank you so much for sharing that snippet with us. Before we wrap things up, I would love to know, do you have any advice for people who are aspiring to narrate audiobooks? I'd say two main things. One, just listen, listen to loads and loads of audiobooks, um, listen to different styles, listen to different narrators. Um, and the other is practice yourself, you know, take a book you like and read it out loud. You can record yourself doing it or, or sometimes just read it out loud to yourself. So those, those I'd say were the, the two big things. And the more you do both of those, the, I just think the better you'll become. Awesome. That's great advice. Great advice. Okay, so thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate the time you spent. Thank you. 
My pleasure. If you are a Jane Austen fan, then I definitely recommend you pick up a copy of the audiobook Dangerous to Know, Jane Austen's Rakes and Gentlemen Rogues. You can find an audible link below in the show notes. Thanks so much for listening. And until next time, take care, everyone. If you enjoyed today's episode and would like to show your support, there are a few things you can do. Head on over to Apple Podcasts and leave a positive five-star review. You can follow me on Twitter and Instagram. Most importantly, you can share this podcast with friends and family that love pop culture, from books and audiobooks to TV and movies. I'll see you next time here on the Shelf Addiction Podcast.